Today, Jesus enters the city with cheering. He goes into the temple. He flips it. He's, he's running everybody out, and he curses a fig tree. There's a lot going on today. You're going to enjoy it. So come and read it with me. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Bible Time. Craig here. Thanks for joining me today. This is the place to read the Bible together every single day. And that's a good thing to feed our soul with God's word. And I know that it's a crazy time. If you're, if you're watching this anywhere near when I'm actually filming this in November, it's a crazy season, but it's a, it, we still have a good shepherd and God is still on the throne. And he's worthy to be pursued and he's worthy to listen to. And if I know one thing, it's that his word is what we need for life. And so, thanks for joining. Thanks for giving your time to reading his word. This is not an academic study. This is primarily um, us reading for the sake of growing in a relationship with him, listening to his voice, and seeing what he wants to say to us. So, that being said, we're going to jump in Mark chapter 10, verse 46. And let's just read today with those eyes, with that lens of saying, Lord, what do you want to say to me in my heart? And is there anything that you want me to change? So it says this, They came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that Jesus of Nazareth had began, or when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him telling him to be silent. Just don't, like, get it. <laughs> I don't get why this happens so much. Like, <laughs> why, why is there so much, like, rebuking and trying to stop people from getting to Jesus? It, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Like, they try to stop the kids. They. Do they think that he's, you know, too busy? Uh, to, you know, needs to be somewhere? Do, do they think Jesus doesn't care about the kids or the, the blind guy? Or, like, maybe they just want, you know, maybe they want him, his time and his attention for themselves. Maybe the dude was being super annoying with his yelling. I don't know. Um, it's just always weird to me when I read stuff like that because, like, isn't the whole point that we're trying to get people to Jesus and not keep them from him? So, I don't know. I love that Bartimaeus refers to him as Jesus, son of David. This is a... You know, referring to David being his, you know, the son of David is a reference to the kingdom. It's a reference to possibly the covenant made with David. Um, it's it's a it's a you know some form whatever whatever degree Bartimaeus knew. It's some form of acknowledging his identity and his authority. So they tell him to be quiet. But he cries all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. I think that this is super funny. Jesus is like, Call him. And he, <laughs> Jesus made the dude come to him, even though he's the blind guy. Like, somehow... He felt his way, like he got there. Maybe the people led him there because Jesus was actually calling him. I don't know, but like, why Why would Jesus not go to him? Why would Jesus make him walk to him? I don't know, but that's what happened. Uh, so, and then just real quick, this cloak situation, throwing off the cloak, um, I don't. I don't know for sure, but I've heard different teachings on this idea that a cloak was given to you, possibly even um, government approved. I, I, I've heard that teaching again. I don't know, 
it, the validity of, of what exactly was the practice back then or not, but I've heard that that at certain times the, your cloak was sort of like your label, your maybe your um, your license to be able to sit on the side of the road and beg. It was sort of this symbol that, yeah, you're blind and there's something wrong with you. And so the idea is that him throwing that cloak off was a form of saying, like, I'm not going to be bound by the things that are have labeled me and, and the, the hindrances of the past. I'm going to Jesus now. So if that is true, that's really awesome. Now, listen to this. This is crazy. Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And to me, I'm like, uh, duh, you know, like, what do you think? But I think that it's imp- uh, like, I guess important and um, intentional that Jesus asked this question because I think that what he wants, what he oftentimes is wanting from us is for us to speak out, to come to him, to ask him for what we want. And so he says, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. We see again that Jesus is referencing his faith. I love that. And then secondly, that his response is to follow him. Good stuff. All right, now we're moving into basically the last week of Jesus' life. It's called the Passion Week, the week of his passion. Um, And so in the Gospel of Mark, starting here in verse 11, only 16 chapters in this book, that's, you know, basically a third of this whole gospel is one week of his life. And so, um, I mean, I guess that is is what it is. Uh, Mark starts off really quickly. There's no birth narrative. There's none of that. It just starts off with his ministry and it gets moving really quickly. And then uh, a relatively small part of Jesus's life is found in a relatively large section of this gospel. So I guess it just shows maybe Mark's, um, you know, view of the importance of exactly what's taking place during this week. So Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and to Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went and they found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? You're stealing. (laughs) And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And when they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it, and many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of the kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. This is a triumphal entry, a celebratory entry. Um, the palm branches that were put down would have been something that it was not unique just to Jesus. It would have been something that they would do. Uh, both, both the cloaks and the palm branches would be something that they would do when a military leader would enter, typically after a war, after a victory. Um, you know, the riding on the colt, riding on a steed would be definitely something in line with that same sort of thing. A military or political leader coming in, sitting on a place of authority, putting the palm branches down as this symbol of honoring the person as they're entering. And then, of course, all of this terminology, blessed, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. There's a reference to King David again. And Hosanna in the highest. So there's, there's definitely this, this stir and this buzz and this recognition of who he is in this moment. I think it's important to remember that this moment happens in Jerusalem and not more than a week later, a very different moment happens with shouts, this time shouts of crucify him instead of shouts of Hosanna. So it's just really interesting to see the difference that take place, takes place in the midst of a week. 
and he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, it was already late. He went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he could not, he found when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat a fruit of you again. May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So he's cursing this fig tree because he didn't find any fruit on it. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables and the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. What does that mean exactly? And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, and they were seeking for a way to destroy him. But they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. So to make something a den of robbers, we see things being sold and purchased, money changers, selling of pigeons. So there's a few things that are happening. Um, the temple is obviously God's house, his church. Um, you know, Jesus says it will be called a house of prayer for the nations. Um, and so this is good to know and um, to think through, like, what was he so frustrated about? And I think that what we're going to see is that there's a tie between the fig tree situations and, you know, what what Jesus, there's an analogy between the fig tree and what Jesus is doing here and what he's rebuking and calling out this during this Passion Week. Um, but the, the kind of like, well, how's this applicable situation? Um, you know, a lot of people in churches these days have maybe things for sale, like a book or a t-shirt or coffee. And so, you know, would Jesus have the same response to those churches that are selling things like that today? And that's a good question. I definitely remember at one point in my life feeling very judgmental and frustrated with any church that ever sold anything because I was like, well, dude, Jesus obviously has a problem with that. He would be up in here flipping tables over. Um, and I remember feeling that way. Um, and so if you, if you feel that way, I understand how you feel. Um, what I found was I, I really believe that what's going on here is that they, ha they completely were not using the temple for godly purposes at all. It was, it was for business. People were doing business for personal gain. They, they were doing personal business in the house of God, and they had just made it uh, you know, a den of robbers. So there was, there was injustice happening. There was financial misconduct of some sort, and this really frustrated Jesus because his house, the temple of God, is meant to be a place that's primary work. The only work is the work of the ministry. And so, you know, where I'm at personally right now, and if, if you don't ever feel like any church should sell anything, you know, so be it. You got to go with your conscience. But for me, um, like, for example, at, at my church, we sell coffee. Uh, but nobody makes personal profit off of that. There's no one person that's making money. That's not personal business. The idea is that people are going to spend their money at Starbucks or wherever, wherever else anyway. And so if we can provide an avenue for them to get that product and to buy it from the church, but all the money goes back into the church. All the money is going back into God's ministry. And so that's the difference is... In one case, people are doing personal business, even robbing from others so they can make money for themselves. And in this case, um, the, anything that's sold, the, the finances are, are being poured back into the church. So that's the difference. 
Um, that's the way I see it, and if you disagree, that's totally cool, but for now we're going to move on. I think that there is a correlation here, though, uh, between what Jesus has seen, what he's going to begin to rebuke uh, in in this city, the city of God, the city of David, and this, this people, God's covenant people, that should be bearing fruit, and yet they're not. And so, um, well, let's just see what this says here in Lesson of the Fig Tree. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. You know, I am challenged by that. Just straight up, to be honest, like sometimes this passage makes me think, man, you don't have very strong faith. <laughs> like you must not really believe in your heart because I've never been able to move a mountain. <laughs> but I'm going to continue to grow and seek the Lord and pursue Him and, and uh, you know, grow in faith as best that we can by God's grace. He continues, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that... It's an important line. Your Father will also, Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Wow, this is serious. So anytime you see so that, it's like, okay, do, do A so that B can happen. And so in Jesus' mind, if you're praying, you got to forgive people so that your Father who's in heaven will forgive you. So it's really important that we forgive. So, uh, you know, again, the idea with the fig tree is, and I think a lot of commentators would say this, that, you know, seeing the fig tree, he, he would have expected to see fruit on it, and he, he got no fruit, and so he cursed it. And this is like a symbolic cursing of the fact that he, he's going into Jerusalem, the city of David, where you expect to see fruit in faith and yet he's finding none. And so in a sense, he's having to curse the city. He doesn't really curse the city, but like there's a symbology there. And so, um, you know, whether or not that's explicit and that's sort of dr drawn out, um, you know, underlying theme. Um, and so it, if you disagree, that's fine. But I think the the idea still remains. The question for us still remains. The question is, are you bearing fruit in your life? Like a fig tree that should be bearing good fruit, like a, like a person that's been renewed by the Spirit of God, that's been saved and forgiven from on high, for somebody that's been born again, are you bearing fruit? The scriptures teach us that there's fruit of the Spirit that comes out of a believer. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, and so many more things that there's, there's fruit that yet they will know you're my disciples by your love that we would walk in kindness, that we would walk in forgiveness like he's talking about, that we'd walk in grace, that we'd be the aroma of Christ. And so are we bearing fruit? Are we fruitful believers and followers of Jesus? I think that that, at the very least, is a good question to ask. And I think that for today, I'm gonna to leave you with that and would invite you to consider, are you fruitful in your walk with Jesus? And maybe spend some time praying and listening to the Holy Spirit about that and um, considering maybe there's some things that you need to cut out of your world maybe there's some tables in your own heart that you need to flip and just run out of your heart for the sake of purifying it I don't know some things to consider so we'll pick up again tomorrow in verse 27 I'll see you then